So it's a great pleasure to announce the first talk by Lars Alsma um, about extremal black hole correction from IR Bolt. Please. Yeah, thank you, Marcus. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present here. Uh, so I'm very honored to be part of the last uh, session, which I guess is a bit festive uh, before we enter um, uh, into the holidays. Uh, what I would like to tell you today about is some uh, work that um, came out last month, uh, which is related to the regravity conjecture. Uh, so I think most of the uh, audience is probably quite familiar with the Schwantland program and the regravity conjecture, but maybe to give you some sort of context, the idea of this uh, program is that when we think about uh, UV complete and consistent theories of quantum gravity, when we take the low energy limit, uh, then it turns out that no, not all uh, effective field theories that you can write down uh, are the low energy limit of a consistent theory of quantum gravity. Uh, so this goes by the name of the swampland. Uh, so we think of the swampland as effective field theories which do not have a consistent UV completion into quantum gravity, uh, which is to be contrasted with the landscape, which is a nice place, uh, which consists of the effective field theories we do arise uh, as the low energy limit of quantum gravity. And then sort of uh, to sort of chart the landscape versus the swampland over the years, what has been done is that there have been different swampland conjectures proposed uh, in order for you to be able to, if you are handed an EFT, for you to be able to determine if it belongs to the landscape or the swampland. Uh, and what turns out is that uh, there are sort of a, uh, a phenomenological um, observation, which is that their usefulness and the rigorousness of the swampland conjectures, they typically show an inverse correlation. Uh, so recently this was coined uh, to go under the name of the auguri hertzsprung russell diagram, uh, which shows two axes uh, containing uh, rigorous and speculative. And on the other axis, there's uh, ranging from useless to useful. So one thing that we think should be true in quantum gravity, and you can, um, there are proofs in different contexts, uh, is the fact that quantum gravity should have no global symmetries. So that is something that you can prove uh, or show very rigorously. At the same time, it doesn't really tell you precisely what is the energy scale where this global symmetry should be broken. So in that sense is not so useful. And maybe on the uh, other axis, which is more controversial, uh, is the De Sitter conjecture, which states, uh, roughly speaking, that there should be no made to stable uh, the Sitter factor in string theory. Uh, so if this would be true, it would be useful in the sense that it would have uh, a lot of uh, implications for phenomenology and cosmology. On the other hand, it's also very speculative uh, and it's not clear if this should be true in full generality. And then somewhere in between, we have the weak gravity conjecture, which you can think of some sort of upgrade of the no global symmetry principle, uh, which is a, sort of in a nice place of this uh, auguri hatchbrun russell diagram uh, in the sense that it's, uh, moderately uh, rigorous, uh, and it's also moderately useful. Uh, but the, what we would like to do, of course, is push some of these conjectures to the corner where they're very rigorous and also very useful. I think that is sort of the goal uh, in general of the Swampland program to take some of these more speculative ideas and try to make them more rigorous. So what I will focus on today is the regravity conjecture, uh, which, as I said, lies in a promising place in the ocean. OHR diagram, uh, and in sort of in its simplest form, the gravity conjecture states that if you take an effective field theory of quantum gravity, that that theory should contain a super extremal state. Uh, so if you, for example, think about uh, uh, four-dimensional Einstein-Maxwell theory, then when we say super extremal, what we mean is that we should normalize it to the black hole externality bound in that theory. So when we take four-dimensional rise and nerd sum at black holes, and then a super, then the black hole externality bound uh, looks as follows. So in Planck units, M should be bigger or equal than square root of two times Q. If this is true in four dimensions. And then the weak gravity conjecture is sort of the opposite bound. Uh, so we see that it's super, ex super extremal or extremal with respect to this black hole externality bound. And the consequence uh, of having such a state that satisfies the weak gravity conjecture is that it allows extremal black holes uh, to shed their charge uh, despite the fact that they have vanishing Hawking temperature. So the weak gravity conjecture itself does not yet specify the precise mass of the state that should satisfy it. So it could be a light state or it could be a very heavy state. Uh, and therefore it's a logical possibility uh, that the states that satisfy the weak gravity conjecture are black holes themselves. And the reason why this is possible is because in principle we can think of, uh, let's say Einstein gravity or Einstein-Maxwell theory as an effective field theory 
that is corrected by higher derivative corrections. So if we're thinking about string theory, these would be uh, correspond to alpha prime corrections. And those corrections modify the black hole externality bound. Uh, and this goes back to uh, quite some early papers. So when you think of the leading corrections to electrically charged right and Norsen black holes, you have two possible um, high derivative operators, which contain four derivatives. So you have this FAB, FAB square term, where F is the field strength. Uh, and you have an FA, FAB, FCD, uh, W, A, B, C, D term. Uh, so this is an FF wild term, uh, where W is the wild term term. And here I chose sort of a specific basis uh, to write these high derivative terms. Uh, and then these different operators, they are multiplied by the two uh, Wilson coefficients. Uh, and when you then compute how these high derivative corrections correct the externality bound, uh, you find the following result. So what is important to note is you have a Q over M appearing, and then there's this correction which scales as 2A1 minus A2. So then satisfying the mild from what gravity conjecture, would require that this combination 2A1 minus A2 is positive or zero in such a way that you have a super extremal state or an extremal state. So similar to sort of a, a particle version of the weak gravity conjecture, if you satisfy this mild version of the weak gravity conjecture, uh, then extremal black holes can decay. So what would happen in this case? So if we um, <clears throat> plot M versus Q, and then if we think about very large black holes, then for those very large black holes, we can ignore the high derivative corrections. And then extremal black holes just obey m equals two square root of two times q. However, when we go down uh, along this curve, uh, then uh, we will consider smaller black holes for which we do have to take into account the effect of the high derivative corrections. And then if the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied, that means that this curve goes down. Uh, and what it means is that if you take such a large black hole, it can now decay to a smaller black hole, uh, which is super extremal, and a sub extremal black hole. Uh, and we know that by doing this computation, when we look at the leading high derivative corrections, uh, that this first uh, part of the curve is monotonic. However, at some point, we, we reach black holes uh, which have Planckian masses. So those would be highly curved. Uh, and then the high derivative correction breaks down. And in principle, we don't really understand what happens uh, unless we go to some particular cases. Okay, so you might think that this is very interesting, uh, but what is the evidence uh, for these types of conjectures? Uh, as with most complex conjectures, most rigorous evidence uh, comes from string theory examples, uh, which gives us some inspiration. Although in the case of the weak gravity conjecture, there are also some non-stringy derivations. And just to give you some sort of overview of sort of the different flavors of um, uh, setups that people have considered, I will give you a few. So for example, we can try to think about uh, charged black holes uh, in ADS, uh, and then we can use uh, the holographic principle. Uh, so then it is uh, shown in um, <clears throat> sort of the older paper by Harlow that if you want to have factorization of Wilson lines in the ADS CFT correspondence, then this requires the existence of charged states in such a way that you can take a Wilson line that runs from one boundary to the other boundary. Uh, and um, if you have these charged particles, you can split this Wilson line and then you uh, find factorization. Uh, a different paper uh, by Montero showed that if you want to prevent entanglement entropy paradoxes in ADS CFT, uh, then uh, what he considered was a black brain solution in ADS. Then you need to make sure that this black brain becomes unstable, uh, which again is very similar to the weak gravity conjecture, because that requires the existence of these charged states in order to decay. We can also think about uh, arguments based on black hole entropy. Uh, so in a paper by Chang, Liu, and Remen, uh, it was argued that at least in some cases, uh, when you consider these higher derivative corrections, that they should increase the microcanonical entropy of the black hole, uh, which then also leads to the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, from a different perspective, you can argue that um, the entropy of a black hole should be finite. Uh, so this is non-trivial when you think about dilatonic black holes, because if you take the extremal limit, what can happen is that they tend to run to zero size. But then if you impose finiteness of the entropy, uh, this leads to some version of the gravity conjecture. Um, there are also arguments based on unitarity and causality. And, and this, these principles have been very much used in the context of the mild form of the weak gravity conjecture. Because in some cases, when you impose unitarity and causality, you can obtain positivity bounds on these Wilson coefficients. Uh, and then because the 
there's a precise combination of Wilson coefficients that control the corrections to the actionality bound. When you can show that sort of the correct combination of Wilson coefficients is positive, you using unitarity and causality, uh, you prove to be gravity conjecture. And finally, you can also use some CFT arguments in some cases, uh, and then modular inference is very useful to uh, show that the weak gravity conjecture should be satisfied. So these are all very nice uh, derivations, um, and they give sort of in different corners of, um, I guess, physics, uh, they give you arguments in favor for the weak gravity conjecture. Um, so in the case when we think about positivity and the amount from what the weak gravity conjecture, then we find that again in the string theory examples that this combination of Wilson coefficient uh, that corrected the extremality bound of rise in nurse on black holes uh, turns out to be positive. Um, so as I just argued, in some cases you can use unitarity and causality to argue that one of these coefficients is positive, uh, but there is no general model independent bound on this A2 coefficient. So you need to assume something more about the UV in order to show uh, that the gravity conjecture is satisfied. Uh, uh, so what we like to understand a bit better is instead of sort of having uh, additional assumptions about the UV, um, we would like to understand um, when do we gravity conjecture follows from sort of a more general principle. So for example, when this FFL term contributes, which uh, was proportional to the A2 term, what do we need to assume about quantum gravity in order to show the weak gravity conjecture? And this will be uh, sort of my, the discussion of the rest of the talk. And maybe I should already briefly pause for questions if there's a short question. Okay, I think not, so let me just continue. Um, so what we'd like to do, or what I would like to show you is <clears throat> how we can sort of understand uh, what properties of quantum gravity uh, lead to this mild form of the weak gravity conjecture. And what I want to do is have to, uh, sort of a more model independent formulation. Instead of sort of on a case by case basis, looking at different black hole solutions, it would be very nice if there's some sort of model independent formulation. So what I have in mind is the following. Let's say they, that I take a black hole um, in um, described by general relativity, so not yet perturbed by high derivative corrections. Then sort of schematically, I know that the, the extremality bound or that extremal black holes obey Q of ram equals to one. What I now can consider is I can now add matter to this theory, which is heavy. When I integrate out that matter, I will generate high derivative corrections. And then in general, my extremality bound or my extremal black hole would have the following form. So we'd have Q over one, Q over M is equal to one, plus some correction that depends on the precise matter that I integrated out. Uh, so it seems natural to impose some sort of general conditions on the matter that I integrate out in order to make sure that the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. What I will do is I will derive a universal expression uh, that does not really specify precisely uh, the matter content, and we'll see what sort of condition I need to impose on the matter in order for the weak gravity conjecture to be satisfied. Uh, and in particular, I will focus on uh, four-dimensional current Newman black holes. So in order to do that, I will make use of the ir Watt formulation, uh, which is a very uh, useful formalism in order to uh, derive, for example, corrections to black holes in a very model independent way. And then the starting point is, is to start with some uh, Lagrangian, which I treat as a D form uh, in D dimensions, uh, which can depend on some arbitrary set of matter fields phi. Then I can consider a general variation of my uh, Lagrangian. And then I know that I will get in, uh, in general some term which is proportional to the equations of motion. So when E is zero, the equations of motion are satisfied. And then there's a boundary term uh, which can be written as uh, the exterior derivative of theta potential. Now, if my action that I consider also has a symmetry that is generated by some factor field xi, then I can define a neutral current. And this neutral current can be written in the following way. So there's some term that uh, parameterizes the constraints of the theory. So again, when the equations of motion are satisfied, this would be zero. And then there's some term uh, which gives you the neutral charge. And then by doing some manipulations, you can relate this to the symplectic potential and an inner product of the Lagrangian that you're considering. So when you perform all these variations, now what you can do is you can integrate over Cauchy surface sigma, then I can derive the following identity. So here I see I relate uh, basically the uh, variations of the neutral charges that are associated with this vector field and the symplectic potential to a variation of the constraints of the theory. 
So at this level, it's a very abstract relation, but now we'll apply it to a black hole and then we'll see uh, precisely why this is useful. Uh, so <clears throat> the theory uh, under consideration will be Einstein-Maxwell theory, uh, possibly with a cosmological constant. And then when you do these explicit variations, you find that the constraints of the theory take the following form. So you have a constraint associated with the metric, uh, which is proportional to the stress sensor. And you have a constraint associated to, in this case, uh, I'm focusing on electric fields. So this would be a gauge potential describing an electric field. And J here is the electromagnetic current. And similarly, there are charges associated with both the metric and the gauge field. Uh, and when you uh, plug this into the previous relationship that we saw and integrate over this Cauchy surface, and uh, then we can derive a useful relation. And then the particular uh, symmetry that we're considering of this black hole background is the, the following killing factor, which is the killing factor for a, a pure Newman metric. So it contains a time-like piece and a rotational piece that is associated with the rotation uh, of the black hole. And then when you uh, plug this all in, you find the following identity. So on the left-hand side, we find that there are variations of black hole quantities, so variation of mass, angular momentum, electric charge, uh, and a variation of the area of the bifurcation surface. And I can relate that to variations of the uh, stress tensor plus an electromagnetic piece. Okay, uh, and now uh, what will be useful is to define this right-hand side and write it in terms of a what I call an effective stress tensor. So it's basically the stress tensor of associated with the high derivative corrections plus an electromagnetic piece. And because in principle, when you consider these high derivative corrections, uh, they will also modify uh, the Maxwell equations. And then uh, what you find is when I consider zero perturbations, so I shut off uh, possible perturbations, then I find that at extremality, at temperature equal to zero, then the following identity is true. So what that means is now when I do consider perturbations, is that it's precisely this quantity that determines the corrections to the extremality bound. So for example, when I take t equal to zero, I consider extremal black holes. Then I find that this uh, variation uh, of these quantities, which determine the corrections to the extremality bound, that those are related to the integral over the variation of the effective stress tensor. And so in here, k was the killing factor of the black hole, and n is the unit normal to the Cauchy surface. At the same time, I can also consider black holes that have for which this variation vanishes. And then I find that the temperature times the variation of the Bekerstein Hawking entropy is given by minus uh, the same uh, integral over the effective stress tensor. So what you then obtain uh, is you can obtain a relationship uh, for the weak gravity conjecture. Because typically when we consider the weak gravity conjecture, we typically consider these high derivative corrections in a canonical ensemble. So that me what that means is that I fix T to be zero and I also fix uh, the charges, so in this case, the electric charge and possibly the angular momentum. And then you'll find the following relationship. So now it's the corrections to the mass that are determined by this integral over the effective stress tensor. So you find that when this right-hand side is smaller or equal than zero, then the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. At the same time, we can also consider a different thermodynamic ensemble. When we consider a microcanonical ensemble, we fix the mass, charge, and angular momentum of the black hole. In that case, we find that this integral over the effective stress tensor determines the corrections to the Bekerstein Hawking entropy. So, what that implies is a relationship between entropy and extremality uh, in the sense that when the mass of the black, extremal black hole is decreased in a canonical ensemble, this implies that the entropy in a microcanonical ensemble is increased. Uh, and this relationship has appeared before in the literature. So, here we gave an alternative derivation of it. Uh, based uh, on the ir world formation. Okay, uh, so now we are ready to sort of make a general statement when the corrections to the mass are decreased in a canonical ensemble, so when the weak gravity conjecture is satisfied. And then we have to remember our definition of the effective stress tensor. Uh, and this effective stress tensor is related to sort of the usual stress tensor that appears on the right hand side of Einstein equations as follows. Uh, so uh, here, t denotes, delta t denotes the variation of, of the proper stress tensor uh, that's related to the effective stress tensor plus a term that corrected, corrects this. So what it means is when the term in brackets finishes, and uh, then the entry corrections to the entropy or extremality, they are precisely determined by the stress tensor. And then the weak gravity conjecture can be really understood as an integral over the useful stress tensor. 
And then it's a natural question to wonder if this could be related to an energy condition that you need to impose on the stress tensor in order for the big gravity conjecture to be true. You have five minutes, Lars. Awesome, thanks. Um, so in general, uh, in order to understand precisely what the energy condition is that we need to consider, uh, we need to understand with what uh, factors we are contracting the stress tensor. Uh, so in the case for the current human black hole, the uh, killing factor uh, looks as follows, and it should be an index here. Uh, so it's, it has a time-like component and it has a rotational component. Uh, so in principle, when omega is zero, so when we are not considering rotation, then this is a purely time-like factor. And otherwise, the character of the killing factor is dependent on sort of the precise value of the rotation. Um, but in the case when uh, both n and k are time-like factors, it's a necessary condition for the v-gravity con gravity conjecture to be satisfied, is that this uh, integrand that appeared, so the contraction of the effective stress tensor with k and n uh, should be negative. Uh, so this corresponds to a violation of the dominant energy condition. Uh, however, in general, this condition is not sufficient uh, because what can happen is that we still need to perform this integral. So it could be true that the uh, stress tensor violates the dominant energy condition at a particular point along the Cauchy surface, but that it gets overwhelmed by other positive contributions along when we're performing the integral over the entire Cauchy surface. So if violation of the dominant energy condition uh, to prove to be gravity conjecture is only sufficient when either there's a more integrated version uh, of the energy condition that should hold, or when the dominant energy condition is violated along the entirety of the Cauchy surface. Uh, so I think uh, option one is somewhat unlikely. There are typically no general energy conditions that uh, integrated energy conditions that hold along space-like surfaces. So it seems more likely that we should consider option two, uh, but we can consider what happens in uh, specific cases. Uh, so what we can consider, for example, is to look at electrically charged black holes in ADFs. And then what we're doing is we're considering uh, sort of the same high derivative corrections that we considered before. Uh, then the metric uh, that we're interested in is that of a electrically charged black hole. And now because we're in ADS, we can now have different horizon geometries, uh, which are parameterized by K. So if K is either minus one, zero, or one, it describes our hyperbolic planar or spherical black hole. So we can consider different situations. Uh, and then by performing variations, uh, we can obtain explicit expressions for the variation of the stress tensor and also for the electromagnetic current. Uh, and in general, this results in somewhat lengthy expressions. Uh, so I will just sort of uh, tell you what happens. Uh, so what happens in this case is when you contract this effective stress tensor with a time-like factor, and in this case, K uh, only is, is purely time-like, then the effective stress sensor reduces to the true stress sensor. So then you can wonder, are energy conditions sufficient to constrain the Wilson coefficient? And then when we consider spherical black holes, uh, so k equals plus one or black brains, which have k equals zero, then we find the following behavior. So then we find that in, in general, the coefficient that is, uh, or the term that's proportional to A2 has an indefinite sign. And it's only the A1 term that has a, a definite sign. So here we see that when we look at the dominant energy condition, that when we violate the dominant energy condition, then A1 should be positive. Uh, however, we can also consider a null energy condition, for example, which is a different energy condition. And then we find that only the A2 term is picked up. Uh, and in that case, when we satisfy the null energy condition, we find that A2 is positive. So sort of in summary, a violation of the dominant energy condition seems to require that A1 should be positive which is actually also the constraint that follows from unitarity, while the satisfaction of the null energy condition uh, seems to imply that A2 should be negative. Uh, so then when we perform uh, the entire integral in order to obtain the corrections to the externality bound of these black holes, we find for small spherical black holes that 2A1 minus A2, again, and the term is corrections to the externality bound. Um, so um, in that case, we find it's the same axiomality bound as for flat space black holes. And this makes sense because these small black holes don't really feel the ADS curvature. However, for large black holes or for black brains, we find that there's a different combination of Wilson coefficients that appears. So we see in this case that only for small black holes, uh, the violation of the dominant energy condition plus satisfaction of the null energy condition uh, leads to the regravity conjecture. Uh, so for fun, uh, I guess we can also consider curved black holes, but maybe I'll just skip that in terms of time. Uh, 
And I'd like to finish with one sort of interesting statement, uh, which is the fact that so we saw that the violation of the dominant energy condition was a necessary condition for the weak gravity conjecture to be satisfied. And you might wonder why is precisely this energy condition that appears. And I think there's a good reason for this, because the uh, quantity that appeared the corrections to the axiomatic bound was this precisely this effective stress tensor. So we saw in some cases it reduced to the ordinary stress tensor, but in general, this is the correct quantity that um, determines the corrections. So then a violation of the dominant energy condition where K and L are time-like factors is required in order to satisfy the weak gravity conjecture. So it turns out that precisely this effective stress tensor is very closely related to the positive mass theorem. Uh, it was uh, proved, I guess, in a uh, more simple way than the original proof by Witten, and later generalized also to uh, include charge uh, by this paper. And what you find that in space time where there's electric charge, to prove positivity of the total mass, it's typically assumed that the stress, that this modified stress tensor or this effective stress tensor is positive. Uh, so what we can then understand why the weak gravity conjecture should violate this condition is that we want to make sure that the perturbations to the mass decrease the mass of the black hole in a canonical ensemble, which then requires sort of a violation of the positive energy theorem applied to these particular corrections. And it turns out that indeed this was also observed in a later paper uh, where this same condition uh, appears, so the violation of the energy condition, the dominant energy condition of this modified stress sensor in order to uh, prove some uh, swamp and conjectures. Uh, so that seems very interesting. Um, and that brings me to the conclusions. Uh, so what we saw is that the mild from the weak gravity conjecture is a very interesting conjecture in the OHR diagram. It's rigorous enough and it's useful enough uh, to uh, be an interesting object of study. In general, we need to compute corrections to extremal black holes on a case-by-case -case basis. However, if you use the Iowald formalism, what we did is we formulated this mild form of the weak gravity conjecture as a condition on the stress tensor. And we saw that a necessary but not sufficient condition is the violation of the dominant energy condition. And in particular cases that we considered, we saw that combining this with the null energy condition uh, leads to the satisfaction of the weak gravity conjecture. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to thank you. Thanks a lot. So are there any questions? If so, please just unmute yourself or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Maybe in the meantime, I can start. So if you start mm -hmm. with, a, with this black hole and then you solve the weak gravity conjecture at low energies by splitting ex or close to extremal black hole into two smaller black holes, mm -hmm. then at yeah. some point so this uh, mechanism will not work anymore, right? So at some point you have a lot of small extremal or close to extremal black holes, and then you still have to do the transition to particles. Can you, can you argue like what scale do you expect this to happen? And if, if maybe then you can use different uh, uh, theorems or uh, approaches that you can say something about the particles that appear at high energy, so to say. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so one thing that you can do, so the simplest thing, I guess, is supersymmetry. If you, uh, if you have DPS states, then it's sort of clear. I mean, it's sort of boring because you just have a straight line. They're like all extremal. And then you can just tune GS. So then you can go from a particle description to a black hole description. Uh, so the more interesting situation is when you break supersymmetry. And then typically you need additional ingredients in order to understand the transition. Uh, so I think there's at least one example where I know what happens. Uh, which is um, something that I studied with uh, Gary and Alex Cole, in which case we could look at uh, modular invariants. So in that case, in the in heterotic theory, you have a transition between sort of elementary string states, which are heterotic string states, and uh, at strong coupling, uh, these collapse to a black hole. Uh, and then, <clears throat> because in that case, the entropy and the mass corrections, they are determined basically by anomalies. Uh, so you can trust them through the transition. So in general cases, you can't really compute what happens, but sort of in special cases, you have like additional symmetries or something, and then you can understand how this transition to particle state goes. And I think there's sort of mounting evidence that indeed sort of the true version of the weak gravity conjecture should be a more tower-like version. Mm -hmm. You have like a number of states and then you have this transition between like black holes and um, more elementary states. Okay. Are there any other questions? Thank you.
I don't see any, so let's thank Lars again. Thank you very much.